Hi, everybody. Welcome back. This is a sort of a part two of the series that we're doing on God's nature. If you'll recall, we already had an interview with Sean Finnegan, who presented the uh, the side of the biblical Unitarian and gave us a good overview and summary of what they believe and what they uh, what scriptures they kind of lean on. And now we are here with Roger Perkins, and he is going to be diving in and giving us some great insights into uh, into oneness and how they view God's nature and what what scriptures they kind of tend to lean on. Um, Roger, welcome, welcome. Well, good to be here. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, I like to open up with um, just to get to know you a little bit, some of your testimony, how you came to how you came to faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah, sure. First, let me t- uh, let your audience know that I'm I'm you know we've had tons of technical difficulty <laughs> um, due to <laughs> due to operator malfunction on my end and also good old Apple. I, I won't go there. I want to have a good attitude the whole time, but, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I don't even have because I'm having to use my phone. I don't even have uh, the scriptures in front of me because of every single device I've got. He's giving me trouble. So this is truly going to be shooting from the hill. Um, <laughs> good grief. Okay, so <laughs> to start off with, I, I guess my testimony. Um, wow, man. So um, I think I sent you. No, I didn't send you that. So it, it, raised, born raised <clears throat> Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I was down there for a long time and um, <clears throat> did not was not serving the Lord as a, as a youth, um, went into the army. I don't remember what, 18, 19, I think was a full or active duty overseas for several years. And, uh, then uh, certainly wasn't living for God there either. Um, got out and just, you know, when I got back home, things really, really, really spiraled out of control um, in every bit of it my fault, you know, due to immaturity, well, due to the darkness of the heart. I mean, sin-stained heart, period. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, the whole gamut of drugs, alcohol, <sighs> prison for, or locked up for almost a year. And, you know, wow. I don't know, man, I, I don't really... For me, I just got, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And so I, um, you know, as I tell the church here all the time, I don't, uh, AA, and I'm not, I'm not running down AA and, and all that stuff, but they kept trying to put me in, in rehabs. I don't remember. I think I was in, I think I was in six rehabs. I tell the church I was hooked on everything but phonics and not ordered tapes, but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so, so with, with that, you know, I just, they, like I said, the treatment centers get trying to push me to the AA, NA, but in my mind, what's, I mean, I guess you could have a better life here or you could for sure. But, you know, I wasn't interested in sitting in the clean and sober section of hell. Mm. And if I was, had not obeyed the gospel and I, and was not, endeavoring to live for God, um, what, what's the point? I, again, I guess it'd give me a better life here, keep me out of jail, I guess, but yeah, you know, it would be a good thing. But, you know, it, it, I'm just a black or white type of fella. I mean, it's either all the way or it's no way. Um, mm-hmm. So long story short, Jesus Christ did for me what nothing else could. Delivered me from drugs and alcohol. Um, man, just... It, it, no better life there's no better life than living for god man and so that's pretty much it now with regard to so you wanting to know that how i come to the position that i owe, hold now with the nature of god or are you just wanting how i come to faith in christ oh for this one just really faith in christ was it um like were your parents in in no, in, no. So was it a, a friend or when you were in prison or how did that work <clears throat> okay so with that I, uh, yeah, there was actually a backslider in prison. I know some people don't believe backsliding, et cetera. We can get into that later if you want to, but regardless, it was a backslider in prison. I I remember, I remember telling him that with regard to what some would call 
external standards, external holiness, etc. Um, I remember parroting to him that, well, you know, those Pentecostal people, they, they teach a lot of bondage. I, I remember telling him, I had heard that from others. And, and he said, well, you know, he said, the Bible does talk about the external. The Bible does talk about, um, you know, the, and I'm not here to get on this, but about the externals. He didn't say standards. I, I don't, personally, I don't, I don't care about standards. I care about Bible doctrine, but that's mm -hmm. later down the line. Anyway, so we, <clears throat> he, he really rang my bell with, with the way he presented it because he did not try to argue with, it. had he argued with me and came at me like that, I would have dismissed him. And, and as usually happens when, when someone takes that tack, you dig in your heels even more. Mm -hmm. And, <clears throat> but he didn't do that. He come at me very humbly, very meek. He said, well, the Bible does talk about that stuff, man. And uh, I remember sitting there and I was waiting, to, you know, my little angle to get him. And when he said that, I said, yeah, I said, it does. <laughs> he <laughs> said, yeah, it does. So I said, oh, OK. So I, I remember going back to my cell, pulling up the scriptures, searching them out, finding them. And that that started me. That started me on, on the on the track. When I got out, my grandfather uh, it was in the church, oneness, Pentecostal. Now, now the moment you say that, I know, I, I'm aware that there will be people in your audience. Say, oh, well, that's why he believes what he believes because of his family. And, because that's why most people believe what they believe. Uh, just a tradition handed down. But that was not the case with him and I. I, I, I would go over there and argue with him and <laughs> argue with him and was attending Trinitarian churches um, and, and I'd go back and pair it to him what they paired it to me. And every time I did, man, he shut me down with scripture. And I, I remember that it got to the point to where I was either going to have to explain away a whole lot of Bible or as I was just going to have to allow the Bible to speak for itself. And so it was an honesty deal that really tormented me for a while mm. and then i started digging in later well i started i started initially digging in once i i received the baptism of the holy spirit <clears throat> um baptized in jesus name etc we can get into that later if you want to but but you know the born again experience and then from there <clears throat> um I, I just man, I just had a, I just had a intense interest in digging. I was single at the time, lived by myself, and um, man, for years, for the first I don't know five years probably, I just I studied, I studied, I studied, I studied everything to get my hands on, and that was a very tormenting time as well. Um, I, you know, people at on my job sites, uh, I was a structural steel iron worker for for many years, and on the, on the job sites, they would hand me tracks that were designed to attack oneness Pentecostalism. And looking back, I probably had no business that, that young even dealing with something. I just, I wasn't ready to handle it, you know? Mm. Um, but I tell you what, it, it, I guess the good point part is that it did force me to go home and dig and study even more. And I, I guess that just kind of took off. And I, I mean, what, 20, almost 25 years later, I'm still doing the same thing, I guess. <laughs> <clears throat> wow. That's, yeah, it's very interesting I, to your point about how, how you came to believe. I think, I think there's a common misconception that one, just because somebody does believe uh, something for a reason, like, well, well of course you're, Catholic, because you grew up Catholic. Right. Um, well, but if Catholicism is true and someone grew up Catholic, it doesn't exactly. it doesn't mean that it's not true just because that's why you came to believe it. And it yeah. sounds like you I mean, you you came to believe it however you did. But then you searched, you dug out the scriptures. So you you don't base. It sounds mm -hmm. like correct me if I'm wrong. You don't base what you believe off of some talks with your grandfather and experience in prison, it, it's based off of your study and how you understand scripture. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't care 
I don't want to sound you know, unnecessarily combative, but I'm just being honest. I mean, I don't, I don't care. I don't care who they are. Um, if it's contrary to scripture, then I disagree with them. Um, but yeah. but when I say contrary to scripture, I mean, we, you know, we, we really emphasize original language, exegesis, um, sentence diagram. I mean, I mean, there's a lot, man. There, there's a whole lot more to it than just quoting something from the King James and, oh, uh, it, it, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it says this. I mean, there's context, there's the spiral nature of hermeneutics. I mean, it's just, it's a whole lot more than what I thought when yeah. I did start digging. And I started interacting with these Trinitarian academics and others. Um, I, I remember splitting my mouth wide open on, I was, I was an iron worker and they stuck me in a trailer with a Jehovah's Witness for, for about a, <laughs> for about a month. And, oh, wow. And, oh yeah, man. Did we ever have discussions every day? It, it was something, man. But, uh, but, but anyway, to your point, yeah. Scripture. I mean, scripture, I, I'm a solo scripture, a guy, total scripture, a guy. I mean, it's what I believe. So there's that. Yeah. I saw just a side note on that. I saw um, your debate with James White on YouTube. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was, was it in Australia that you did that? Yes, it was. Um, so it sounds like at least those two things you have in common, because he's a, he's a big solo scriptura and Toto scriptura guy as well. How, how was, what was that experience like? Just, I mean, getting in a, <laughs> getting in yeah, a debate well, like that, going for three and a half hours or whatever it was. <laughs> Man, well, I, I I don't know. I, I had done the, I mean, that's really nothing compared to the Church of Christ guys I debated. Man, they would, they they like to do this long, drawn out for. I debated one guy in Texas four days, Bible four college days. Over there, wow. yeah, four nights, two two and a half hours per night, uh, for a whole week. <clears throat> Texas Bible college is there. A lot of them were and. Uh, wow. So, so James White was pretty uh, mild when it comes to comparison to them. But I mean, I guess the thing that 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 impressed me the most about the whole deal was not even Mr. White, but it was uh, Craig Ireland, the guy that flew me over there. Um, it was a one night debate, and yeah. he flew me over there, put me up for a week. Um, it was his wow. idea. Uh, I, I had I, the only other option I had was coming in right before the debate and uh, flying overseas and then jumping, <laughs> you know, uh, on, on the platform. I was like, no way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> you know, that was that was that, um, I, you know, after that debate, I started um, I, I mean, I had just started dabbling around a little bit in Greek um and and hebrew i just started kind of dabbling in it some but i you know i was getting more interested as time was going on i mean i didn't i didn't take formal hebrew and greek because of that debate in no way shape or form i i just got to where i, I you know I, people started coming to me for questions and i thought I, I tell you man to be honest james three and one do not be many teachers knowing you will incur a stricter judgment that is what drives me. I live with that every day in the back of my yeah. mind that, you know, I, I better make sure that I'm not being influenced by well-meaning people that could be wrong on either side. Mm, yeah. Trinitarianism, oneness, Pentecostal, you know, I just want to be a biblical Christian, man. I mean, drop all the labels of heretic and, and orthodox and unorthodox and all this stuff. <laughs> Let's say it's the scriptures, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. I, um, so for those that may not know or, or may be looking at it themselves, give us the, the 60,000 feet. When, when you say oneness in, in oh. relation to the nature of God, what does that mean? What do you believe? Okay, so uh, first place, let me say that there are so, and, and you know this, but there are so many straw man attacks across the board from Trinitarians, from oneness, I have heard. I mean, I'm here I am throwing off on, <laughs> I guess, some oneness people here, but but I've heard some oneness people say with their mouth, preaching and stuff that, well, Trinitarians tell you there's three gods. Oh. And every time I hear that, I I cringe because yeah. they do not say that. 
Yeah. Now, do I believe that's the concept in their mind? Oh, you better believe it all day long. And we'll get mm. there in a moment. But to be fair, they don't run around saying, oh, hey, I believe in three gods, everybody. Let's praise the Lord. You know, they don't do that. <laughs> right. So anyway, with, but same thing with us. You know, they say, oh, well, one of these people believe that Jesus is his own father and uh, Jesus praying to himself in the garden and, and all of these straw man attacks that I've never heard a one this person say in 25 yeah. years. So with regard to that, there's misunderstandings on both sides. What do we believe? I can't speak for everyone. I can speak for me in the church that I, that I pastor. Um, we believe that Jesus Christ is the one Old Testament God revealed in the flesh for the redemption of whosoever will for mankind. I'm aware of the Calvinism, the elect, the tulip, and all. that's a whole other issue. But, but that's what we believe. It's very simple. The same individual that we read about in the Old Testament is the same individual that arrived on the scene at the incarnation. He's God with us. I think that's Matthew. Yeah, Matthew writing to the Jews. He identifies Jesus as God with us, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. the, the Jews would never, the Jews would never accept an idea that this is a second person in, in, in a Trinity or, or, or in the Godhead. <clears throat> I mean, we can get on Alan Siegel's The Two Powers and, and all that later if you want to, but simply put, we believe that in the New Testament, God entered into a new existence that he did not have under the Old Testament. Uh, I know about Angel of the Lord that from Judges and Genesis that Trinitarian apologists try to use to prop up that this is supposedly the pre-incarnate son. We can get into that later if you want, but simply, we believe Jesus Christ is God Almighty in the flesh. Simple. Father and Son are incarnational terms, which, by the way, is why you don't find them under the Old Testament. For 4,000 mm -hmm. years of Hebrew revelation, the Son's always prophesied of coming. Kiss the Son. I, I, I know people are going to try to appeal to that i would we can go there if you want later but i would just appeal to the hebrew there that is a is so just look at the net on that passage i'll just leave it at that um so that's what we, what we believe uh, the holy spirit is god in spiritual activity that does not equate us with the jw's who believe that 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 the holy spirit is an impersonal force we don't believe that god is hmm. personal so god god is personal then, but he's not tri-person, and there's a difference. Mm. Just because we have terminology of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I mean, we believe in the distinctions, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So to, to cite those, as Trinitarians very often do, from John 14 to 16, you, we, we can quote that all day long. We, we believe every bit of that. But what we don't believe is that that demands God the Father his own mind, God, the son, his own mind, God, the Holy Spirit, his own mind. Absolutely not. We don't, we do not, but we do believe in father, son, Holy Spirit. Um, so Jesus is God in the flesh for the redemption of mankind. We do believe that the son is God in the flesh because I hear, and I read this all the time from Trinity, every debate I've ever done, they bring up, well, one that's Pentecostals don't believe that the Son is God. Yes, we do. We believe that the Son is God in the flesh. Yes, we do. So that's basically the quick rundown, very briefly, of what we believe. Okay. So a couple of, couple of follow-ups as you're talking there, just making some notes. Um, all right, so... So you would, I think you would agree, I think, then with the Unitarian position, because they say God is unipersonal. He's one person. Yes. However, we need to distinguish between the, the religious movement of, of Unitarianism, where that they deny that Jesus Christ is God, that the Son is God, and then Unitarianism in the sense of one person in God. Right. Because a lot of your listeners... Um, an audience, they, they, they hear Unitarian and they think, oh, they, oh, they, they deny that, that the Son is God. There are Unitarians that do, but we don't, we don't believe that. So, okay. Okay. So, so then when it comes to, and then it sounded like you said that the Holy Spirit, you would look at that as that's, that's God's Spirit. So, yeah. 
Yeah. I have a spirit, you know, the, the spirit is it Corinthians that says, yeah. you know, no, no man really knows himself except the spirit. No man knows a man except the spirit of the man himself. And so you would look at that and say, hey, that's, that's God's spirit is the Holy Spirit. So they're one and the same. Well, that passage that you're quoting in, in 1 Corinthians, I mean, it, I think the next verse, if I'm not mistaken, says, uh, even so, the Spirit of God knows no, what, what is it, knows no man or knows no, I don't, I don't remember the rest of it. But I do remember the even so part, because again, I don't have my Bibles in front of me to read, man. Um, I'll but, pull it, yeah, <laughs> let me pull it up real quick here. 1 Corinthians 2.11, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Mm. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Right. There's your Greek adverb. I think it's Greek adverb. I have to look at it, but I think that's what it is. And so there's the, there's the adverb connecting it the same way as what he just said. And, and then we could go to 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 17. I mean, it's just all over the place. You know? mm -hmm. Okay. So then, so that's the kind of the spirit. And I'll, I'll say the Holy Spirit and the Father, and then between the Son and the Father, is there a, is it the Father came, put flesh on, and he's just the Father walking around, or is there a, is there a man somewhere in there as well? Is Jesus also a man, or is he, or is he just the Father with a fleshly body? Well, yeah, I don't, I never, I've never heard that from one of Pentecostal. He, he's just the father of, of a, with a fleshly body. We yeah. say, as the scriptures do, that he is God in the flesh. He's 100% God. He's 100% man. But there is an ontological distinction between father and son. So oh, okay. there, therefore, that is the biblical distinction between father yeah. and son is the ontology. The son is God in the flesh. The father was known as Yahweh under the Old Testament. And incidentally, um, the, the, in John 8, where they pick up stones to stone him because they just couldn't take it no more. And he, he defines himself as ego Amy. And I've heard Trinitarians try to say, oh, well, see, that's the son defining himself as prior to Abraham than, than, than he was as the son. Uh, they didn't pick up stones to stone him because he was calling himself a second person in a god is. They picked up stones to stone him because he was claiming to be ego Amy, the Septuagint rendering of the same Yahweh that called out to Moses from the burning bush. That's what incited them. And a Jew would never, especially during the time of Christ, they would never accept the idea of a triune divinity. And, and, and I'm going to say that I'm not here to you know, every, every argument that we bring up, I mean, like if I preach on oneness here, at the, I, I don't, everything's not a knee jerk reaction to Trinitarianism. I don't right. run around saying, Oh, well, you know, I mean, they don't define me. So I just want to clarify that. For them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when, when Jesus in the garden is, is praying. So I think you mentioned before, people will say, you know, was Jesus praying to himself? So based on what you said with the ontological distinction between the two, when he said, not my will, but yours be done, there is a man, mm -hmm. and then there is the father. So there, mm -hmm. there are two wills, there's two minds there. Is that correct or not? Well, you know, here's the thing with that. First place, let, let, me, let me allow the context to define that. Notice when Jesus comes out and he finds his disciples sleeping, what does he say to them? He says, he says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Why would he make that distinction? Right? You don't find him making it nowhere else. Why would he make that distinction right there when he's praying? Because he just did it. That's why. Mm -hmm. He just understood it completely. The humanity is weak. The, the divinity is willing, if, if you please. You, you have mm -hmm. a strength in, in there. So, so we believe Jesus is God in the flesh. Now, your question was that... Uh, that oh two minds two minds yeah well two will, we so scripturally i guess i guess scripturally it would be two wills but i i struggle to think that some being mm -hmm. has a will but not their own mind so i i tacked on the mind as well and said you know does, is jesus as a man does he have his own will in his own mind absolutely I, okay. absolutely he does i mean he, he said he did he, he yeah. said that that not my will, I did, well, you quoted not my will, but your will. Um, 
there's many other places. Uh, I'm trying to think. I think on the cross, it seems like there's maybe my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or, I, I don't remember. There's something else along those lines. It would indicate, yes, he has a will. And, and that will, I mean, as you said, he said, not my will. In other words, basically to paraphrase, Jesus is saying, look, I don't want to do this. Let this cup pass from me. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, let your will be done, not my will. So very clearly, there is a human will and there is a divine will. Um, I, I don't personally, I've never understood. I'm not saying this toward you, but I've never understood why that's why that's a problem with some people. I'm not saying you have a problem, but I have. It seems like that's always a sticking point that that's always brought up. And, yeah. and especially from a Trinitarian perspective, because they tell us Genesis 126 that God is speaking internally. But then when we hmm. say, if we were to say that at the, at the prayers of Christ, then all of a sudden that's heresy. You yeah. See? I, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'd love, I'd love to ask that. I'm trying to get a hold of uh, someone in the Trinitarian ranks that will do this same yeah. uh, type of sit down. But to me, I think in asking a Trinitarian that my confusion there would be, so in a oneness sense, I can see, like you said, if, if, if Jesus is a man indwelt by the Father, he has his own mind and his own will, I can see how he can say, listen, as a man, I'd prefer not to go to the cross, but your will is that I do, so I do it. But in a Trinitarian sense, I, I'm sure they have a, an answer. I just like, like to hear what it is, because uh, that seems like God the Son would actually have a separate will want to do something different than God the Father, which I don't, my understanding of the Trinity, I read James White's book, um, my understanding of the Trinity is that's not possible. They're always of the same kind of will, they're in unit, complete unity, they wouldn't have a differing of opinions, in other words. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't want you to speak for a Trinitarian, I, I don't know, I just... <laughs> well, it, well let, me, let me say this, but I'm, yeah, I can pretty much tell you what they're going to say. <laughs> they're going to say what, what you just said, that uh, that there's no separation in the wills, that they are always in unity, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But they do not hesitate to say three separate minds in God. Mm-hmm. I know that I know that hmm. there, there are certain Trinitarians that would that, that cringe when they hear that. A certain Trinitarian apologists that cringe when they however, every single debate that I've had, now. I, I don't even remember how many I've had anymore, but everyone that I've had, the person I'm debating has used the word separate, not distinct. He's including James White that you referenced earlier, separate minds in God. How on earth can anybody think that we still have one God? If you have hmm. separate minds and they are that separated that they can differ with one another, I don't want to do this, but I will. Um, I, I'm sorry, uh, this is where we get into what I would call conceptual tritheism, not confessional. They don't say it with right. their mouth, but conceptual, you know, I, I do believe that. But um, and I want to say, too, real quickly, that I think that we all need to remember that Paul says great is the mystery of godliness. Uh, God was manifesting, and, and I know there's a textual variant there. Um, I, I won't get into that. It's a whole other thing. But r- regardless, Paul does say about the incarnation look this is a mystery how can we understand the eternal becoming a man i mean if trinitarians or anybody else is looking for an explicit exact all the mechanics of it they, they can't provide that and i don't yeah. know a person that can provide it, including paul <laughs> yeah so i um i do have a follow-up question but i but you mentioned the textual variant though in timothy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um my, I've heard about that, and my my curiosity with that is, is there is it a textual variant? But the overwhelming evidence is he who was manifest in the flesh, or is it pretty? It's pretty up in the air, and you could really go either way with that and say he who was or God was manifest in the flesh. The issue with with that is what's called the nomina sacrum. Um, with with what that is in textual criticism is your listeners will be familiar probably they would abbreviate the names of the 
like say God, well, in this, in this sense, it would be God. They would do it by putting the first letter and the last letter. Uh, and then they would put a, put a line over it to signify that this is referring to God. Well, the, <laughs> and what you just uh, uh, quoted, he, who, or who, the only difference is one line that goes through a theta or a, a, a missing line through an Omicron. And they're writing on what? Papyri, which has Papyri, what in yeah. it? Lines. <laughs> Lines. So there's not a, the overwhelming, to answer your question, the overwhelming evidence says God, but that's only because of the Byzantium uh, Western, uh, and, and that's an oversimplification, but the manuscript tradition from what some would call the majority text, and then you have the critical text, uh, the Alexandrian text, but I would just point folks to uh, Dr. Dean Bergen's infamous work that he did on uh, on this textual variant. He gives unbelievable amount of evidence for God was manifest in the flesh, including Alexandrinus. So Codex Alexandrinus. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you, what was his name? Dr. Dean? Yeah, uh, Bergen, B-U-R-G-O-N. It's an older, I want to say it's like maybe late 1800s or early 1900s work, but I've got it, the PDF, and it is, it's unbelievable, man. It's like 200 something pages, I think, of just nothing but straight up evidence, you know, hmm. early evidence. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting textual variant that uh, I've heard many, actually many times brought up in different uh, different debates and different, different scenarios. So what I was going to, what I was going to ask you about is First um, Timothy. I'm sure you're very familiar with it. I'm sure it comes up all the time with these uh, with these debates and, and and really just discussions overall. First uh, Timothy two five. Uh, there's oh, yeah. one God, one mediator between God and man or mankind, right. the man Christ Jesus. So, uh -huh. it, it in my understanding of that verse, basically, I mean, in the context of what you just said about Jesus and God or Jesus and the Father. Are, are different ontologically um, sounds like that's th that's indicating three parties God which would be the father man which is you know or mankind and then Jesus as a as a mediator between the two so God indwells Jesus and Jesus is a man and therefore he he mediates between the two is that is that what that scripture says? Well, let me say that with regard to the indwelled, I mean, it says earlier, it's not just that, that we say that God indwells Jesus, though we do believe that, but he is also God revealed in flesh, God in the flesh, not in the sense of just putting on an inanimate suit of flesh and that later becomes animated. We don't believe that. So when right, we say, okay. is, is, is he God? who became a man is he god did god indwell a man all of the above there, there's no need to in my view at least to flesh out all of these contradictions <clears throat> that really are, aren't even a biblical uh concern they're more for us i guess in this day and age but regard with regard to first timothy 2 5 i'm glad you brought that up the the masculine singular i, I would assume you've heard me use this before you have the adjectives for there is one god it's masculine singular haste uh and the, which is the masculine demands one person it demands it and we'll get there in a moment <clears throat> and then and, and this is what i've heard some trinitarian apologists recently try to pull to come up with uh two to say well mr perkins if <clears throat> If, excuse me, if one God is masculine singular haste, and then you have one mediator, which is also masculine singular haste, then you have two. And we believe that there is a, to some extent, a two. You have divine, you have humanity. I, that does yeah. not in any way prove a, a trinity. Um, so there's an ontological separation. There's a, there's a man who is a man. He's got his own mind. He's exactly. separate from the father in that sense, mm -hmm. but they are one in the sense that, well, I, I know some translations of John 3.34 say it differently, but but basically, they're, you know, 
it, it seems to indicate he gives the spirit without measure within Jesus Christ. I mean, I, most believers would say they're filled with the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so we have God in us, but obviously we have a human father and a human mother. So Jesus, his, I'll say, infilling or indwelling, if I can use those terms, was without measure. It was far different than what we have. So he was a man, but he had this almost like this fullness of God in him. I, I guess Colossians says that, right? <clears throat> yeah, those are some. I, I like some of the language you're using there. Yeah, that's very good ways to to, to put that. Uh, you know, for example, when you said a moment ago that the flesh or, or the humanity of Jesus is separate from the there's a separation. For me personally, I I tighten up a little bit when I hear separation because I don't. I don't really care for the, and I'm not throwing this at you. I mean, I've done it my, uh, myself many times, but I don't really care for such a radical separation. He was inseparably God in the flesh, mm -hmm. uh, but there are ontological distinctions in between invisible divinity, which was then visible in his humanity. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so there's some people, there's some oneness that don't believe that Jesus had a human spirit. Um, there's hmm. some Trinitarians that believe Jesus didn't have me. I do. I believe that if he's going to redeem us, he has to be like us in every way except for sin. And he was. Or he can't be our kinsman redeemer. <clears throat> Otherwise. So, but yeah, you know, with regard to, I, it's, to me, that's the one of the nails in the coffin. It's 1 Timothy 2, 5. Paul says, if you're to do exegetically, God would have all men come to the knowledge of the truth. I might want to tell your Calvinist buddies that one, but, but I know what they're <laughs> going to say about that. But regardless, and then he says, basically he tells you what that truth is. Here's the truth for you have a four uh, clause, a, a conjunction. I think it's a gar clause. I haven't looked at it, but I think that's what it is. It's gar for, I'm going to tell you the truth here. Here's the truth. There is haste, one God, masculine singular, and mm -hmm. one mediator between God and man, haste. Masculine singular, the man, Christ Jesus. Nothing there about Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Nothing there about a triune divinity. Uh, it, it, I mean, to me, and, and we need to remember that this is Paul's, not his last letter, but his second to last letter. And he's emphasizing some things that's really important to him for Timothy, uh, Bishop of Ephesus, to, to carry on. He knows he's on the way out the door. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I just looked up, I was just, while you were um, talking on that, I, I pulled up the scripture in Hebrews. I think that you were referencing Hebrews two seventeen, where it says for this reason, he is referring to Jesus. Yeah. If you want to go back and look at it, he had to be made like them exactly. fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God. And that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So yeah. It does. It does sound like he that in whatever way he's human, he is absolutely human, just like everybody else. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I'm glad you went there. I was thinking of that when I brought. I was like somewhere in Hebrews. I wasn't sure exactly where, but yeah. So that that cinches it up perfectly, in my opinion. Gotcha. Okay. So so would it be? Uh, and again, I don't want to. Please correct me if I'm wrong here. I want to make sure I'm getting this correctly. So you would say then. Jesus is God by virtue of the fact of, of the Father indwelling him the way he did. Well, virgin uh, birth. Yeah, now, that, again, that, well, that is true. That's virgin true. birth, uh, you know, he, he's yeah. only and unique. <laughs> Nobody like him before or after. So I don't want to I don't want to get to the little gods and that kind of stuff. Well, oh look, oh look, we got the Holy Spirit. So we're, we're gods too. I'm not going there. I'm going more with just kind of a way to explain it to people. Yes. Jesus is God, but he's also a man. The reason he's God, the reason we don't say we're God, there's a virgin birth, there's, there's spirit without measure. He, he's human, but he has the Father indwelling him in fullness. I think Colossians 2, 9 says yeah. God. Is that, I mean, is that accurate? Yeah, the reason that I, I, I we say God was manifested, but I, I don't care for the language that fa the Father was manifested in the flesh because you don't find father terminology relative to the son of god in the old covenant you only find that post incarnational you, you, i mean trinitarians can can sw swat at the 
angel of the Lord all they want to. I mean, I, I've got quotes by Metzger and I don't know how many others, but scripture mm-hmm. itself refutes that idea that the angel of the Lord is not the pre-incarnate son of God, no matter how hard they try to force that in. So I, I don't, I'm, I, I kind of hesitate when I hear the father was manifest in the flesh because when at the time of the manifestation of the Old Testament, it was Yahweh in the flesh. I mean, I, I don't I don't split hairs over it. I just yeah, because Jesus know, actually said that a couple of times, didn't he? That, that the absolutely. father indwelt him. Absolutely. John 14, 10 relative to your Colossians 2, 9. Not, that Yeah, that that's another one, man. That's another one really, really helped me to see the truth. Um what I believe to be the truth is, is for in him dwells all the fullness of the divinity, the Godhead. You want to use that translation bodily. I, I'm I'm well aware of what Trinitarians say about that, but I don't want to, you know, I don't want to chase the rabbit trails here. I'm just, this is your show. <laughs> yeah. But, but I think I mean, I'm just looking it up because I think offhand. Yeah. It says it actually twice in Colossians in Colossians mm-hmm. 1 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. So it's clearly saying God and him, you have Jesus Christ. So, I mean, and then it reiterates in Colossians 2, 9. It seems like it's pretty obvious that the fullness of God was dwelling in, in, in Jesus. But again, I'm sure that I'm sure when I talk to someone in the Trinitarian side, they'll they'll have a different perspective. It's just it's yeah. interesting. That they you know, will reiterate it twice in, in two chapters in Colossians. Yeah, absolutely. And then, of course, how many times we read the God of Jesus? The mm-hmm. I, I mean, that is hugely problematic for co equal. <laughs> and and, and gotcha. they can't just they can't just use that with the incarnation because we find that post incarnational in Revelation where he talks about his God. This is post-incarnation now. He's, he's not, I understand that forever, for eternity, he's going to have that glorified body. I mm-hmm. do believe that. But my point is they cannot attribute that to him being incarnate on the earth when he said that. Because that's typically oh, what when they he said. Oh, when he said, I go, I go to my God and yours? Well, that's another one. But no, I'm talking about in the book of Revelation, uh, where he's talking to the churches, and he references... And again, this off the top of my head, but he says something to the effect of I will make him a pillar in the kingdom of my God. <clears throat> and it's a paraphrase or I'm paraphrasing it, but but that's that's not earthly language. He He's in heaven now. Revelation 3, 12, the one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again yeah. will they leave it. I will write it on them in the name in the name of my God, in the name of the city of my God. Yeah. The New Jerusalem says it several times. Looks like four or five times in those couple of verses. Okay. Yeah. And then we could go Revelation 22, 3 through 4. One name, one face for God and the Lamb. I, I understand the syntax there. That Trinitarian scholars will often appeal to syntax, but I don't want to go too much beyond what your listeners might be familiar with. But just the point is, it, it, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. cool okay so so i think yeah i think the the interesting thing is when people because i've heard there's three there's three kind of primary ad hominem i, I don't really know if they're ad hominem necessarily they're mm-hmm. really more misunderstanding i think of the oneness position but the first one is and I'm sure you've heard it, right? That you're Jesus only. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, but it sounds like you wouldn't necessarily agree with that because <clears throat> you're, you've got a distinction ontologically between Jesus and the Father. <clears throat> right. And, and let me just say that I don't, it's not just me. I, I don't know a oneness pastor alive who doesn't believe. And I, my God, I guess I know probably thousands, man, uh, <clears throat> interact with them quite often. I, I don't. You know, I don't know a pastor or, or a saint, for that matter, that would say that we're Jesus only in the sense of denying the Father, because that's that's the attack. And, and, and Swaggart's the one who really popularized that years ago, <clears throat> um, mm. that we're Jesus only. Um, we're not Jesus only. We're Jesus everything. 
Mm. That is, he you're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. If if that's if if the second person in the Godhead is the head of all principalities and powers, uh, that doesn't sound like co-equality to me. Um, mm. So you know the point is that we believe Jesus is everything. You're complete in Him. Gotcha. Okay. The other the other one that I hear a lot is, and again, I think I really. I think a lot of it is misunderstanding of the position, possibly. I, I was talking to Sean Finnegan, who's a, a biblical Unitarian, and there's a lot of people that misunderstand much of what they believe as well. So they'll say these yeah. things like, you don't believe this? It's like, I, I never said that. But uh, yeah, I've right. heard, you, and I'm sure you've heard this too, that you're, you're modalists. So God, yeah, you know, know. God kind of like changes hats <laughs> and he's one thing at a time, but you just yeah. explained how you've got all these things operating at the same time. So it doesn't sound like any kind of modalism. Well, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I didn't even put that in any notes. But but yeah, so modalist. <clears throat> you know, the funny thing is, when I, I was I pastored a church in Mississippi, and then I resigned, and I, uh, I I sat under a man, Brother Patton, good man, Kenneth Patton, and and I was assisting him, helping him to some extent, and I really just went into like hibernation mode, man, uh, studying, uh, getting into serious academics, getting into serious uh, apologetics and stuff, which led me into the various debates and all. That's a whole other story. But my point is this. I, I, I had been in the church for, man, bro, I, I, six years or so, I guess. No, no, way long, probably like 10 years or so. And I never even heard the word motivate. And so I start digging and I keep seeing this word, modalist, and I'm like, what are they talking about? So then now I fully understand what they're saying. They're saying that Sabellianism or Oneness Pentecostalism is but a revival of the earliest heresy called modalism that started. And I've heard so many times I can quote it. The problem <laughs> is that, number one, and we can get into early church fathers anytime they want to, but but the problem is that they believed in sequential modalism, father, and then father becomes son, no more father, son becomes Holy Spirit, no more son, sequential modalism, you mentioned the James White debate, I think, uh, and I think that was, I, th I think it was there, if I remember correctly, that he, I think it was him, that, that made the statement that, well, with regard to Colossians 2, now, oh, Mr. Perkins believes that the, that the son, that Jesus is now in the mode of the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. And I remember hmm. writing down on my notes, I don't have a sweet clue what he's talking about. He don't even know what we believe. I, we don't believe that. I mean, we do believe Jesus is the Holy Spirit. I, Jesus himself said, said that in John 14. I will come to you. Um, <clears throat> we can get into that too. But my point is modalism that's not a fair caricature, okay, of mm -hmm. what we believe today. Um, I have never, the point I'm making is, I've never heard a oneness pastor refer to himself as modalist. It, mm -hmm. It's a straw man attack from Trinitarians. I mean, how would they like if we ran around all the time saying that they're tritheists? I, I do believe that in, in their mind, but I don't run around all the time saying, oh, they're tritheists, and it's the ancient heresy of tritheism you know, all of that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I th th those are common. I try to get rid of those, like get those out now, even with the tritheism thing, you know, I think a lot of people will, will just say that. And it's like, Oh, that's the game changer. That's the clincher. Mm -hmm. And you end up classic straw man, right? It's like, this is not what they're talking about. And we knock that over and the debate basically just hangs around uh, polemics at that, <laughs> at that point. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, I, and, I, and I do believe that there is a lot of straw man misunderstanding. There's a ton of it, man. Um, yeah. And But, I mean, we can get into the tri tritheism thing later, but and if you want to, or maybe another show, whatever. But for me, when you tell me, I'm not saying you as in you, but when they tell me that the baptism of Christ, you've got the God, the Son, standing in the water, his own body. His own mind. I, a debate I did last year. A guy was arguing for this. Uh, hmm. a, the 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 dove comes down. That's an animal body. So we've got a bodily separation here. 
And that's God, the Holy Spirit, representing God, the Holy Spirit. Interestingly enough, when I pointed that out to my opponent last year, he said, well, it doesn't say that the dove represents the, the Holy Spirit. So my response was, well, then even better, because now you've got bodily separation in God all day long. And the Jews were standing there that day. They didn't gasp and say, whoa, look, we got a trinity. And and I'm not being smart, Alec. I'm just pointing out that when you argue for bodily separation in God, don't just stop with the monotheism claimers, because it's not true. Yeah, I'd be interested to see if there's a lot of, uh apologists on the trinitarian side that really put a whole lot of stock in the baptism of jesus i've never thought i do think mm-hmm. there are some compelling scriptures that trinitarians have that hey that, I, we should look at that i've yeah. never considered that one Not even a, remotely i mean you have a voice you got a dove and you have jesus standing there okay well that's a good point i'm glad you brought that up because but whenever my opponent did bring that up i, I thought novice the reason i thought that was because the, some of the other people I've, I've, I've debated and interacted with that have doctorates, et cetera, and they're on a different level, that never comes up. They yeah. never bring that up. <laughs> yeah, I've never thought that was very com- compelling, but I guess some no. people might. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so the last one, the last kind of pejorative, I'd say, is that you've got a, I've heard people say either a, either a two-minded Jesus or like a, if they're really you know, he, heating up the rhetoric, they'll say a split personality Jesus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess you want me to address that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, the deal about the, uh, let's see, what do they say? They say you got a bifurcated Jesus, um, that he's completely bifurcated. You, you know, here's the, the first thing I think is right back at you. Show me a Trinitarian yeah. that believes that the flesh of Jesus or the humanity of Jesus was the spirit. That's the ancient heresy called Eutychianism. You can, you can look that up if, if you wish, but, but nevertheless, right back at you. I mean, we all wrestle with the full humanity of Jesus mm-hmm. and the full divinity of, of Jesus. So, I mean, they can throw that out all day long, but yeah. here's the problem from my perspective. They have to wrestle with not just three minds, but four minds within God, because they have God the Father, his own mind. They have God the Son, his own mind. They have God the Holy Spirit, his own mind. And then you have the human Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. So you have a human mind, unless you want to say Jesus didn't have a human mind. I've never heard them say that. So Hmm. the bifurcation is not the people who say Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, yeah. Um, we recognize an ontological distinction just like everybody does just about. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's the other, um, that's, that's what I've, again, when I hear these things in debates or listening to people or reading, I, like I read, uh, David Bernard's book, I read James White's book. I've read some stuff. Um, Dale Tuggy's book on, um, Unitarianism, but the, uh, when people say things like that, it, I just laugh because I know. You, you like you're right they all, everyone believes that well, <laughs> now well, if you say and, and split also, personality I mean, it sounds bad but. exactly well also genesis 126 the moment i hear that from anybody the first thing hits my mind is genesis 126 because most of the time trinitarians are throwing that out as a straw man attack as you mentioned and mm-hmm. i think wait a second <laughs> you're bifurcating i mean you're telling me that this is the trinity speaking internally So you have an internal conversation going on within the Trinity, yet you say we're heretics if we do it. So yeah, yeah. I just I I don't I don't really like those um, those kinds of arguments. I I think Mm -hmm. I think the best the best approach is really to 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 get down into the scriptures and see where the strength Uh, and weakness of the arguments are, and and debate there rather than rather than these kinds of things. But sometimes it's a lot easier to to (laughs) win a few points polemically um against yeah. an, op- an opponent but i wanted you to address those because I, I i felt and again you to me you, you addressed them all all three of them in less than like seven minutes so not, oh. they don't there's not a whole lot of weight behind them um so i have a couple of questions here just based on our discussion um when 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 it comes to jesus and you know i'll say the son and the father 
Um, would you say, and then of course we have the Holy Spirit, Dale Tuggy in his book um, and, and some of his podcasts and stuff, he makes a distinction. He'll say that <clears throat> there's Trinitarian with a capital T, and that's that's the Trinitarian viewpoint of uh, Father, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, tripersonal uh, God. But then he'll say there's Trinities, actually that's the name of his podcast, Trinities Podcast, but Trinities with a, with a lowercase t, and that most Christians in some way, shape, or form believe in the Trinity. It's just how they view it. So I would say, you know, with with oneness, yeah, there's a trinity there. There's three. Trinity just means three, but it's it's far different than the trinity with the capital T. It's not that it's you know quote unquote Jesus only or modalism. It's no, there's Father. He's God. He's yeah. And, and correct me if I'm wrong here. I'm just trying to make like kind of a summary. Father, that's Yahweh. That's that's the Old Testament. That's everything. Then we have Son who comes into the picture in the incarnation, not not uh, before uh, he, and I want to get to John one in just a second, but he's not before he's, he's incarnate. He's as a man, he's separate. Well, you don't like separate distinct from the, from the father ontologically got his own mind, his own will. And then you have the spirit. So there's a Trinity there, but the spirit is not separate from the father. It is the spirit of the father, just in a way that's in action or at, or at work. Is that. Well, I, that's, uh, let me say first, it's just to that last point there. Uh, we actually read it. You actually read it earlier to us. The point uh, in with regard to the spirit in, in Corinthians, where it talks mm-hmm. about the man, the spirit of the man. So Paul himself used the uh, the human beings as the reflection of these things. So I'm a father. I'm a son. I have a spirit. I'm a pastor. I'm this. I'm that. I, you know, I wear all kind of different hats at, at yeah. one time, but that does not. When I became a father, uh, or I or I, I didn't split off and become somebody else, I just entered into a new relationship, and yeah. and that's why we don't find father son language under the Old Testament. You turn to the New Testament, and it's everywhere. What happened? Right. The, incarnation. the incarnation. That's what happened. So yeah. So, but with regard to Mister Tuggy's point, um, let me just before I forget, let me say that there is. I would agree agree with him to some extent. There is a difference in school Trinitarians and uh, street Trinitarians. And, and mm-hmm. let me explain that. Your school Trinitarians are, you know, I guess some of the academics that, that we've discussed with over the years. They, every, I mean, and these debates are all over YouTube, so anybody can go hear them. They have no problem saying that there are separate minds in God. Um, I hope we can at some point get to the book of Daniel and Revelation, because I would argue they also argue unwittingly for separate bodies in God. I mean, Hmm. with Daniel 7, if that's God, the son walking up to the ancient of days and that's God, the father, we got bodily separation all day long. Um, No Holy Spirit. But regardless, so school Trinitarians, that's what they believe. They're more tritheistic and I'm not being ugly. But street Trinitarians that we witness to all the time, talk to them, they don't believe that. Mm-hmm. Um, you can read, da, da, I think it's, I think it's Dalcour and uh, White. Uh, I think they both make the statement that uh, people that you would, you would quiz in the Trinitarian churches, they would test out as what they call modalism. We just clarified it's not modalism, but they would yeah. say one with Pentecostalism. Yeah. My response to that would be, why? What is it in the Bible that's causing all these people to arrive at the same conclusion we have? I mean, hmm. that's really problematic in my mind. So I agree with Tuggy to some extent with that. Um, what was the other, the small T, the big T? Oh, okay, so, so one is Pentecostal, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, I don't, I don't use the word Trinity with regard to us in that sense. I, I know what you're saying. and. and mm-hmm. I would agree to some extent. Even I've even thought that before, but I just think that it places a gavel in the hand of others unnecessarily um, because we yeah. also believe in the son of man. We also believe in the ancient of days. We also believe in all of these other names that would are titles, whatever you want to call them that would apply mm-hmm. to God. Um, but the name is Jesus Christ, Matthew 28, 19. And I, 
I know about Granville Sharp's rule and, and all that that they use there. We can maybe discuss that too. But the point is, you know, we believe that with Jesus Christ, you're complete with everything. When you say Jesus Christ, you've said it all. Gotcha. Now, just a side note I, um, on the on Granville Sharp, I I I'm not uh, well versed in Hebrew and Greek stuff, but I but I am able to research and look look what other people have said and read up on some things. It seems. I guess I don't want to load the load the question, but but I mean to me it seems like what did he have like six rules and like five of them have been completely disregarded. They hold on to one, but he he narrowed it down and made so many like exceptions yeah. to it. It sounded and his his purpose behind it was even the whole purpose was he wanted to prove out a specific point of view. It almost feels like he just contrived something a rule to fit mm-hmm. what he already believed. Uh, yeah, yeah. And when you when you started in on that, I was I was actually thinking, you took the words right out of my mind. I was thinking, you know, when you have more exceptions than you do rule almost, there might be a problem w- with that. Yeah. The reason that he had to have so many exceptions, and by the way, incidentally, he never applied Matthew 28, 19 to his rule. Never. So <clears throat> that's something later Trinitarians have done. Um, hmm. We've got emails from like Dr. Daniel Wallace, et cetera, uh, who, ha- who says you cannot use Granville Sharp's rule with regard to Matthew 28 and 19. I'm aware there's others that have uh, emails from Dr. Wallace that say that, that, say that you can. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the questioning, the format of the questioning, the context of how the hmm. question is posed. But regardless, you know, here's why he has to make all these exceptions up. Revelation 1.8, I am, and I'm trying to remember, so I, Ego Amy, I am the Alpha Chi Ha Omega. I am the Alpha, so there's your definite article, or articular noun, here's your conjunction, coordinating conjunction Chi, and the Omega, which with the article preceding, well, nobody's going to say that the Alpha and the Omega are different persons in the Godhead, uh, uh, John 20, 28, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember, Kaiha, wait, Theosmu, uh, you are the Lord of me and the God of me, Cranville Sharp, you have the articles, the repetition, it's all there, yeah. but those are classified as, as exceptions based upon context, well, Matthew 20, 19 has a context too, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, and I, so tell me if this is just too much layman thinking, but my other thing is Granville Sharp was in the 1700s, I believe. And it's, it's interesting to me that in all the, the debates throughout history, this never came up until Granville Sharp. Somehow a man living in the 1700s knows Greek and the related Koine Greek and the related rules better than people that lived 1200 years earlier than him. That seems well, that's weird. a good point. <clears throat> That's a good point. However, to be fair, Trinitarian scholars would probably say, well, he just, and, and I think there's some validity to this, he just mm-hmm. found what was in the, the, the Greek manuscripts. It wasn't that he come up with anything differently, but he just found what was there. I mean, I'll be, I have to be fair mm-hmm. here. Granville Sharp was an ingenious individual. I, if, if I've got my facts right, I think he disappeared for like a year or two. I may be wrong about that, but somebody, I think it's him, disappeared for like a year or two and came back uh, after he'd been studying Greek and become one of the greatest Greek scholars to ever live, my understanding is. But the, um, I've, I've got interaction with a, uh, a, a Greek scholar named Basilius, oh, Basilius Silas, or something. I'm not saying it right, but he's on the Be Greek Forum, he used to be, and he is a Greek uh, scholar in Athens. <laughs> he might know a little bit about Greek. Yeah. And he, wow. he just shredded it. He shredded Granville Sharp's rule. I mean, it's just, it's nothing but again, it's like Angel of the Lord, just trying to force something that's not there. Yeah. Yeah. I just don't, those kinds of things, again, I, I really feel like there are some really solid, really good mm-hmm. scriptural studies on right. all of these Unitarian, Oneness, Trinitarian without these contrived because when you say rule 
like by the Granville Sharps rule, it's like, oh, that's settled. It's over. You know, debate's over, go home. Then I started studying it and I was like, wait a minute, (laughs) this is far from over. Exactly. Um, Yeah. So my question was um, getting back to the, to uh, sort of the, the father, the son, and I'll say kind of current state, you, you mentioned earlier about um, Jesus, sort of like now, mm-hmm. when in, in John 14, where he says, let's see, John 14, 23, Jesus, replied, oh, I know. Yeah, yeah. anyone who loves me, obey my teaching, my father will love them. We will come to them and make our abode with them. What just so what do you think he's what, what is he saying there when, when he says we will come okay. to them? Okay, first place, let, let me just say real quickly that I don't know if you've heard about the the John 17 5 argument. Well, now the Father glorify thou me with glory I had with you and Trinitarians make a big deal about the prepositional phrase parasa oi. Uh, that it, which demands at your side, they will say. Um, interestingly, Jesus uses the same preposition here. So uh, will Trinitarians stick to their guns and say that the, God the Father and God the Son is now literally at the side of, uh, of all believers? No. So, so they'll shift the, the Greek preposition as it fits their belief system. So that's mm. the first point. The second point is that how many times have we said, let's see, what are we going to do today? We're, we're, we are dialoguing internally. Jesus could speak as a man. I mean, he had to speak as a man if mm-hmm. he's a true man. So as a man, he can say, we're going to do this. We're, because there is that ontological distinction. And that ontological distinction is going, to, is going to answer everything, all these distinctions that we see, such as, such as this. I, I, I mean, Trinitarians are not going to say, because I'm, you know, I'm saying this and I'm thinking, well, if they heard me saying that, they would say probably, well, the man is not going to dwell in the believers. They would probably respond to that. However, as you pointed out, this is John 14 and just up a little bit is where we get the context. And he says that uh, the, the spirit of truth is with you. Um, you see him. Uh, he will be in you, and that was a man speaking, he will be in you, and then he really uh, says it all, he really senses it up nicely, and he says, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. Well, he's not going to come to them as the man, but he did come to them as the Holy Spirit, and so I would argue well, that's the context. I mean, he's already defined himself as the spirit of truth. Uh, in that same conversation. And so uh, I would appeal to the context, Jesus is speaking as a man, and there is a distinction between the man and between the divinity. Um, but we don't bifurcate them like there's some radical, <laughs> you know, there's an ontological distinction that every movement has to or has to wrestle with. Um, but yeah, he speaks as a man. So like I said, and, and, and you know, here's the thing. Every time a oneness advocate makes that assertion, uh, it, it's the distinctions between the man and the, and the divinity, <clears throat> the Trinitarian, it just seems from my experience, they, just, they go berserk, man. Oh, well, then he's not a man. He's just, a, or rather, he's not God. He's just a man. He just, he's just the plan from before. I've heard that. From before mm-hmm. the salvation, uh, from before the foundation of the world, and and it's really as we we're talking earlier, it's a straw man. I, I don't know a oneness person that says, "Oh, he's just the plan." No, oh, he's just a man. He's God Almighty in the flesh. But yeah. there is that distinction, just like we can say we. Um, you know, it, even if uh, I mean, what about the man in the parable that Jesus said he? He spoke to his soul. He said, I will say to my soul, mm-hmm. soul, take your ease. So, I mean, Jesus uses that kind of vernacular. So Jesus has already defined himself in, mm-hmm. uh, in the context of John 14, verse 16 through 18. Of course, as we know, there was no, like if you were standing there that day and you were listening to Jesus speaking that, 
he's already defined himself as the spirit of truth who is coming to you. And I mean, in three, it takes up three whole verses. If you want to get, that's a pretty good pericope of unit of scripture. Um, and so we would hear that he's already identified himself as the father and as the Holy Spirit. Uh, 14, nine, where Philip asks the see the father. Jesus, and, and I think this is even stronger than he that seen me seen the Father. Note how he responds to Philip. He says, Philip, have I been with you all this time? And you're still asking me this? It, my father is someone other than me. Can you imagine someone asking me that? Hey, where's your daddy? And me saying, have I been with you all this time? And you don't know. It make absolutely no sense. So, right. Jesus expressed surprise that Philip didn't understand that the one he was asking to see was standing right in front of him. Mm -hmm. And then you go down and you have the Holy Spirit where, what, 16 through 18. And then we get to verse 23. It is the natural, in Greek, it's called the authorial flow. It's the flow of the author of, uh, of how all grammar operates really and so he's already identified himself as father son holy spirit so okay so you mentioned um, you mentioned that some folks will say you know about the the plan or yeah um he's just a man or just a plan I, i'm so i think that's a good time to kind of get into some of the pre-existence language um uh obviously it sounds like you're going to john 1 1 there if I'm a, I'll put on my Trinitarian hat for now and just say, Hey, you know, John one, one in the beginning was the word or was with God word was God. Um, doesn't that prove pre-existence? Hold on. I'm getting a call. I'm trying to turn this thing down or turn uh -oh. or decline it. Good grief. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. Am I there still? Yeah, you're back. <laughs> um, a pastor calling me. Wait, I was calling him. <laughs> so, um, Okay, so so you're what were you asking about the pre-existent son, right? Yeah, does John one one is that is that oh, your yeah, cut yeah, yeah. Okay. shows pre-existence or how would you? No. Okay, so what they do, man, I wish I had. I, I can't get to my document. I have a sixteen-page document on that, that that I had in my Mac that I was going to use um, in my iPad. So, okay, so okay, so John one one. First, let me say this, okay. We have to, like, you're asking me these questions, and I, I'm, uh, I mean, I'm fine to answer them, but I think we need to remember that it's kind of like in a, in a boxing match. If you have a man up against the ropes and you keep, you keep lobbing stuff at him, lobbing stuff at him, lobbing stuff at him, it may not be hitting, he may be, but, but it's going to make him look bad either. Mm. And a lot of times we have this. What about Genesis 126? And you explain that. Then we go to Daniel, and then we go to Revelation, and then we go to John 17. And you're 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 playing cover up. You're tracing, you're chasing around all the rabbit trail. I could just as much, and I would say, mm. what about Isaiah 4424? The masculine singular participle. What are you gonna do with that? The single yeah. person pronouns, 9,000 of them on the old testament. What are we gonna do with that? So I just think that's very important to keep in mind. Yeah, we have 50. This is off the top of my head. There's approximately 50 texts saying that one person created one by himself, all alone, etc. You have, I think, six. This is off the top of my head again. I think like six or so pre-existence, what they would use pre-existent passages, and hmm. every one of them appears in a psalm context. These are hymns, ancient hymns. Colossians 1, Philippians 2, John 1. These are hymns. They're hmm. lauding the Christ, but they're not lauding him as a second person. Um, but let's get to the, the Greek of, of John 1, 1. And again, this is just off the top of my head because I don't, I can't get to my stuff. But Colossians, or rather, what is it? John 1, 1. So the Greek is in our K. That would be in beginning. I, I want to try to quote it from the Greek and then give you not to show off. I'm not doing that, but, but <laughs> I want to give you the exact uh, translation, the syntax, everything goes very important when we get to John one, one C. So John one, one would be in our K in beginning where we get the word archaic in beginning, in beginning, I say in our K a 
Let's see, in our ain halaga was the word. So in beginning was, and they seize on that verb was as um, let's see, what is it? In our ain, yeah, ain. So they say it's the imperfect tense of of ain, meaning that when the logos, or rather, in the beginning, the logos was already there. That's the assertion that they're making, okay? Because when you hear in the beginning, uh, the Septuagint, which I, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm sure you understand what the Septuagint is, no. um, the Greek translations of the Hebrew text. So the, the prepositional it's phrase... The, it's the Old Testament. So for those that don't know, this yeah. it's the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's the it's the Old Testament Bible that they would have been using in Jesus's day. Yeah, absolutely. The New Testament writers uh, appeal to the Septuagint far and away more so than the Hebrew text. So in our K is the same prepositional phrase that is used in Genesis 1.1. So any reader of John 1.1, when they read in our K, they're immediately going back to Genesis 1.1. That's the context. And then Ain Halagoth was the word. So Trinitarians will say, well, see, was, that's the imperfect tense of aim. And so therefore the imperfect tense denotes, and this is true, this one part is true. The imperfect tense denotes ongoing action in the past, okay? Hmm. Um, tense is kind of a misnomer anymore. There's a shift in Greek verbs right now with aspect, but I won't get into to a lot of that, just for simplistic sake. So in our case, in the beginning was the word, Kai, uh, and the word was with the God. So be Kai Ha Prostanteon. So and the word was with the God. The article is there, and then it says Kai Theos Ain Ha Lagos, and God was the word. That's the that's the syntax. That's everything of the of what exists there. So what what the Trinitarians are asserting? Is, they're asserting two things. Number one, the, the claim is made that the imperfect tense of ain, where it says, um, in our case, ain halagos, was the word that demands that it demands action prior to the beginning, antecedent to the beginning. Therefore, the word was already in existence before the beginning. That's their argument. Are you tracking with me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the argument. Um, but that is an abuse of the imperfect, and I'll prove it in this context right here. If you keep reading down, verse 4 says, And he was, ain, the light of men. That's the imperfect tense as well. Will Trinitarian scholars stick, because they can't say it's a different context, same context, same imperfect tense used, same word, everything. Will they say that the that he was eternally the light of men it's ain the imperfect tense he was ain in the world and the world was made by was he eternally in the world mm. no and we never hear that they don't say a thing about that and so that's the imperfect tense same context everything so they're gonna have to be consistent and and they're not gonna do that it just denotes ongoing action in the past and the context, like when I was like, every time I say context, I think of how many times my Greek professor, there was not a class that he did not say, so how do we know about what this meaning should be? And at the end of the, you know, class, we, everybody's just like context. I mean, he just, they wear it out, <laughs> context, 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 context. That's why they say context is king. So the context is the beginning when God spoke. And when he spoke, what did he say? It's the first time he spoke and he said, let there be light. And that light is the personification of Christ. But that's not a second person in the God. And I can prove it as we read on down. He was the light of men. John the Baptist did not declare or claim to be that light, but he pointed to the light. And I'm paraphrasing because I don't have mm -hmm. it in front of me. But the whole thing is light, light, light. And that light was Christ 
in the same sense that that rock was Christ. Typology. Jesus would say, I'm the light of the world, the hmm. son of righteousness, Malachi. So he was pre-existent in that sense. Absolutely. Romans 5, 14. Adam, the figure of him who was to come, not the figure of him who was. That would have been a really good place to put that. He didn't say that. So that's the first issue. The second issue is the, uh, the, the definite versus the qualitative usage of theos, which is translated as God. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. It, it, this is so simplistic, overly simplistic, but I just want to give you the, the thumbnail version. The definitive versus the qualitative tag basically says that in John 1, 1 B, where it says, and the word was with the God, that the God is articular, meaning that it has the definite article prior to it. Greek doesn't have an indefinite article. Hebrew doesn't have an indefinite article. So we just say that it's an articular noun. So there's no sense to say uh, um, indefinite because it doesn't exist. So it's an articular noun, the God. And they say, so right there, we have a, a definitive tag of identity. This is the God. But then when you go into John 1, 1, C, it has Kai Theos, and there is no one, uh, Kai Halagos. And so people like Dr. Wallace and uh, I think his name was Harner, Phil, something Harner, I can't remember his name, Dr. or know, Dixon, I can't remember. Anyway, I have it all in my document. They, they argue for, they argued for the qualitative tag, saying that, and I quote, that if the definite article preceded theos or God in John 1, 1, B, then we would all be oneness because that would be definitive. He would be saying, and the God is the word, but the article's missing. It's what's called a preverbal anarthrous predicate nominative. And what that means is anarthrous means it lacks the article. It's preverbal because it precedes the article ain. And there's, uh, oh, I said the article. Uh, and there's a predicate nominative. It's, it's, it's telling you something about the subject, which in this context with the article is logos. So, so what they're saying is that, as Dr. Wallace and others have translated, they say, and what the word was, uh, the, let's see, and what the word was, let's see, in the beginning was the word, word was with the God, and the word was divine. That's what they say. So they're saying that the word has the same quality as, as God. That is to say that he is divine. And so that's the qualitative versus the definitive. Simply put, if you have the definitive tag of John 1.1, 1, 1, then we have oneness on our hands. But in order to have, they argue, in order to have the uh, article, or rather, in order to have the definitive tag, you'd have to have the article. And that right there is where, the, is where I take issue. No, you don't. We know that John 1, 1, B is, our, is articular. The article's there. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Prostan theon, with the God. And then the next phrase is kai theos, ain halaga. You have one coordinating conjunction that is linking uh, John 1, 1, C, God, to the God in John 1, 1, B. It's not a superordinating conjunction. It's not a subordinating conjunction. It's not a disjunctive conjunction. It's a coordinating conjunction. He's linking it together. We know John 1, 1, B is, is articular the noun. I mean, the article's there, or rather definitive, the article's there. And so Trinitarians are asking us to swallow the idea that from in the space of one coordinating conjunction, John goes from the definitive tag to the qualitative category with just one coordinating conjunction. If that were the case, this would be the only place, not just in John's literature, but in the entire New Testament Greek text that we would have this. The only place that that would, that that would be. If you keep reading down in John 1, there's many places where 
that we have an anarthrous noun, and yet it is definitive in, in both meaning and translation. I want to say, because again, I, I don't have access to my document right now, but I want to say maybe it says the king, you are the king of Israel or something to that effect. Uh, I think that the king, I think the is not there. I think it's an articular or rather a anarthrous noun. But everybody knows there's only one king of kings, Lord of Lords. So you don't have to have the, hmm. the article when you've got the syntax of a coordinating conjunction there. Are there any Trinitarians that believe this? Oh, tons. Um, D.A. Carson, I've got emails. Uh, Lane McAuffey, you had uh, Lane McAuffey did an infamous work where he did argue for what's called Coel's rule. Um, I, I won't really take the time to get into this, except to say, or to get into that, except to say that Trinitarians often say that, well, we misunderstand Colwell's intentions when we, when we appeal to Colwell's rule. Um, no, we don't. Colwell himself said that he, that he omitted the qualitative tag. Colwell himself address the issue of the qualitative I mean, i've got his pdf i've got the journal he wrote it in. so hmm. th that is not true uh, that is completely false but you got lane mcgoffey you got evie gochias who uh did a modification he's a greek linguist did a modification to the work put out by lane mcgoffey with respect to the definitive tag uh you got bruce metzger leon morris d.a carson tons of them that, that do believe in the definitive tag so yeah. you know people will then say well then why aren't they why aren't they oneness then if, if that's the case the same reason that joseph thayer was a unitarian in the sense that he denied that jesus was god almighty when his translation of weiner's uh greek text he in his lexicon you can see he says it over and over that Jesus, he has to, because that's, that's the Greek, uh, that Jesus is God. So, I mean, he puts in some, some, some commentary trying to get around it in some places, but it's not very, very often. Simply put, religious tradition, man, is, I don't know of a more stronger hold than religious tradition. And I'm not going off on these men. Uh, D.A. Carson, I, I, he's a fine scholar. I love reading his stuff. Um, but I'm just telling you, they all say that they hold to Cowell's rule and that they hold to the defendants of tag. But they, hmm. they themselves are not oneness. But that's the grammar. You know, there's other considerations that then enters the conclusion. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> but but weren't there, there have been... Um, trinitarians that do not believe in like the the eternal generation of the sun right, and right. this kind of stuff anyway I, I think walter martin was one didn't believe that right. um so it's yeah. interesting there's some variation there you don't hear that much but well i was thinking that earlier it's interesting you bring that up i, I was thinking about that that debate on the anchorberg show some years ago that <clears throat> or he was there anyway I, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just move on. But but anyway, um, he that came up and he said that he didn't believe in the, uh, the in the eternal son, but he did believe in the eternal Lagos. And so Trinitarians will say, well, yeah, but he did believe in the eternal Lagos, who was distinct from the father. He just didn't believe you son. In other words, they'll water it down. Mm. But but if anybody else says that, oh, they're heretics. And, well, I'm asking you the trinitarian scholars is walter martin in hell was he a heretic then if he was then you need to throw away his book kingdom of the cults because um, why, why are we going to read his his angle <laughs> so your so your position would be uh john 1 1 is it is the the logos the word the, yeah the, the forethought or plan is what is what it's referring to there that that of course was mm -hmm. eternal because it was forever in the mind of god but then yeah. is it verse 16 or whatever? It, it was actually made flesh and that's the incarnation. Yeah, exactly. Verse 14, it was made flesh. And, and then <clears throat> that, that is indeed the incarnation. But, you know, I don't, I, I don't say 
and I know you're not you're not making this assertion, but I don't say just the plan. I mean, he was the center of everything, the center of right. creation. Christ was. I mean, the Old Testament, as you probably know, says by his stripes, we are healed, pointing to Calvary. And the mm. New Testament says by his stripes, we were healed, pointing back. So you have everything hinges on Calvary. And it always right. did. And that's why, you know, the light was Christ in the same sense that the rock was Christ. Same in perfect tense, by the way. <laughs> Ain't. So are Trinitarians going to say that literal rock was literal Christ? No, it's <laughs> typology. Right. Yeah. And I try to, I try not to use those words like mirror or just. And no, I, I do it. I, I do it too. Yeah. I mean, even with the, with Unitarians, people will say, oh my goodness, you're saying Jesus is just a man. It's like, well, I mean, you know, the, the full, the Messiah, the Christ, the full plan of God come to fruition. If you want to say just. <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. I, I fully understand that. So that's, that's interesting. So just to kind of sum up. So you're, you're saying that with the, in, in section B, the word was God or the word was with God, that, that God, the ha theos, it really doesn't need to say ha theos again in section C in the word was God, because the, the chi there, the conjunction, the and Mm -hmm. just, Mm -hmm. just links them together. Well, yeah, I mean, it's prostantheon is the, is the, the prepositional phrase of John 1, 1, B was with the God. So we know that's the particular, it's there, or definitive, the article's there. And then you only have from John 1, 1, B to John 1, 1, C, you have uh, ton theon, chi theos. You have one coordinating conjunction that the, the, the rule or the, the function of a coordinating conjunction is to link them together. Hmm. There, would have, there could have been another conjunction. And Trinitarians are asserting that in 1-1-B, we have the quality. And then in 1-1-C, or rather, I'm sorry, 1-1-B, we have the uh, definitive tag. And then 1-1-C, we have the quality. So it completely switches the categories all based upon one coordinating conjunction. That, that's a lot to swallow. And it's very important that we note that this would be the only place in the Greek New Testament, where that would be the case if this was what was going on. And th- that, to me, is is very powerful. Got it. Okay. And then, so, uh, sticking with the with the theme of the, the pre-existence or, uh, or uh, you know, kind of Christ, Jesus being in the Old Testament or, or before the Incarnation, in, in Colossians okay. 1... You know where it talks about you know it, all things were created by him for him. Yeah, um, I've heard some Unitarian uh, discussion on that that I thought was really interesting. What, what, how would you sum that up? Just kind of well, what's your without getting too well, deep into the. I don't think you know as far as getting into the Greek and the. I know there's a yeah. lot of varying opinions on on the on the syntax and the language. So just like a step back from that, just overall, how okay. do you view the? all things were created by him and for him. Well, okay. So yeah, my wife brought me my ESV. So I do have just the ESV, just the my Bible here. So Colossians, you know, interestingly, it doesn't say, and this is where the help of, of studying Greek is actually, you know, taught me a whole lot more. The interesting part. So, so here it is. ESV verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, the image is a cone. That's where we get the word icon. It, you can look at I me. Mean, I've got lexicon after lexicon. By the way, um, my blog, apostolicacademics.com, has all of this stuff and so much more on there. I haven't written anything on there for a few years, but uh, everything we're talking about here today and plenty more is on there. We deal with patristics, Greek, etc. Uh, that is on there. So, so, but with this, the word icon, icon is always, always denotes something tangible, something corporeal, something physical, if you please, something you can see and touch, etc. Kind of like morphe, form of God. He is the image of the invisible God. So, I mean, the context here has to be something that is visible. 
because if this is pre-existence and the second person has to be just as invisible as the, as the first person, the third person, but for he is the visible image of the invisible God. Uh, the Amplified Bible translates based upon that. The firstborn over or of all creation. And then we have this, this all important gar conjunction. Oh no, actually it's hottie. It's a, it's what's called a, it's called an, a dependent clause in Greek. And I won't dive too much into that, but what that means is what Paul just said in this, by the way, him in verse 15 uh, he is now explicating. He's now unpacking more in verse 16. Mm-hmm. Well, verse 15, he's talking about the visible image of the invisible God, which, of course, is the creation. And then he says for and, and this is what's important. He, the Greek is actually for in him. The Greek is it's in. I want to say in the date of case, that's usually what that preposition is in. But I have to look at the Greek text. But I think that's right. But it's in him not by him. Now, some translators have opted for that, but that's nothing more than preference. Uh, mm. The actual Greek is for in him, all things were created. We have a, we have a uh, passive voice. He, you know, I, I didn't really understand for years what they were saying until I, until I did try to, you know, take formal Greek. And, and then I, I, you know, when I got a better understanding of it, uh, you know, and the assertions that they're making is that he was actively the creator. And that is the words they use too. No, he was not. This is the passive voice. And I'm not being ugly, please. But if if they don't understand the difference between the passive voice and the active voice, you learn that in first year Greek, um, then there's a problem there. This is passive voice. Not that he was actively the creator, but that in him, all things, were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, or the thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things, let's see, all things were created in him or through him and for him. And he is before all things. Another thing to point out here is who is the him? Who is him? The, the, the pronoun him, who is it referring back to? Every single one of these hymns, you go down through verse 18, I think it is, that you were, I think you were quoting earlier, perhaps, mm-hmm. verse 19. And but every one of these uh, pronouns refers back to verse 15, who is the acom, the visible image of the invisible God. It is perfect with what we believe about John 1 and the light. All things were made through that light. He was the figure of him who was to come, Adam. So this is, again, a him lauding the position of the Messiah, which all things were hinged upon. And that's exactly what he said. That's the grammar. I mean, that's just the, that's just the grammar. I mean, they can put in, but they're going to have to use a, I mean, they're going to have to force feed a, an active voice verb into a passive. Now you may say, well, what is, what is the response they give to that? One Greek professor, in fact, my Greek professor, Dr. Maury Robertson, is a fine man, is a good man. We, I asked him about this. I said, you know what? I mean, this is active voice. So why is it, why are Trinitarians saying that this is, excuse me, passive voice? Why are they saying that it's active? He replied, he said, that's a good question. He said, usually what they say is that, or what we say, well, I think he said, but what we would say is that this is a divine passive. That in other words, saying that this is referring to God, so it's a divine passive which can take on the meaning, kind of like a what's called a, a deponent a verb. So some of your people will, will know what I'm talking about there, but so it can take on the meaning of the active. Here's the thing with that. I, I don't think I told him that, but but the thing with that is I read that and I thought that's that's not the grammar, that's nothing but the belief system, and then later. I found a quote by Dr. William Mounts, who basically said, the divine passive is a non-existent category. <laughs> it, it just, I mean, it's just something they come up with. So they can say the act of creator all they want. They're going to have to find. And, and then if you go down and keep reading in Colossians, we find, I want to say, because I looked for some syntactical parallels a few years ago. And I need to get into my blog. I haven't been on my blog in forever. But I think 
that somewhere, well, in fact, I know, somewhere else down, a little bit down in Colossians is the same, uh, same word, were created. And I think that it is, it, it, it's like a different morphology or parsing or something. I can't remember the details. I probably should just not even bring it up. But there, there was something else in Colossians that I found relative to the, the uh, maybe I found an active voice, I think, of that verb. And it's not, obviously, the inflection is different than the passive voice. So you can't just make up a, a willy-nilly, oh, it's a divine passive, and therefore we got the Trinity. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's not how it works. Gotcha. So... I mean, basically, because it's passive, let me just make sure I understand. Because it's passive, if we pretend for a minute that you're taking the position that uh, there is a God the Son, even if it was talking about God the Son, it's not saying he actually had an active position in creation anyway. It's saying... No, absolutely not. Okay. So I mean, even, if the, whole... even if the Trinity was true, this isn't something that proves yeah, exactly. God the Son was active in creation. Yeah, exactly. And, and in fact, I mean, every again, and, and I never hear them address this, but every single him or in him, or all, who is him? Who is the referential identity of him in verse 15? The visible image the icon. of the invisible God. I mean, that's just the grammar of who the nouns are, are the pronouns are modified. Gotcha. Um, but, but then if you keep on reading, like in verse 18, that's something else I, I wanted to point out. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, firstborn from the dead. And here's the really, really important part, that, that in everything, you have what's called a henna clause here, which introduces a, well, a subjunctive. Anyway, that in everything, he might be preeminent. This is why all this is going on. For, there's your, there's your again, unpacking further. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven. And this is the important point. This is why I'm quoting this, this last clause. Making peace by the blood of his cross. Pre-existent? Pre-existent? Mm. I mean, this is the same him. This is the same context. There's no dodge. I know they're going to try to come up with them, but the, the grammar will not support that. The context, the referential identity starts with a comb, the visible image, and it concludes with the visible image, the blood. It's perfect with what we believe. Gotcha. Okay, so it's really referencing the original subject all the way through, which is oh, not, absolutely. which is not a, um, it's not a God the Son. It's a, it's the icon, which which is the right, right, exactly. which is the yeah. the visible. So you mentioned earlier morphe. That that's that's Philippians two, right? Is that yeah. the same kind of thing, or is or is icon and morphe different? <clears throat> uh, they're synonymous. They, they are used. Uh, they're very closely related. And and let me point out one thing before I leave Colossians. You just jarred my memory again. The the acon, I think it's Freeburg's analytical Greek English lexicon. I don't remember which one it is. I've got it on my on my blog though. And they say they they use the this term to uh, either they say the incarnation or I don't remember, but there's something there about the physical, the earthly life of Christ, or maybe it's the incarnation. But one of the sources says that this is the incarnation. And I'll just remind us, these are Trinitarians uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Relative to Colossians or Philippians two, yeah, the the um, the the Greek noun morphe form of God is synonymous with uh, icon or icon. Uh, so yeah, you have the same thing going on there. Uh, again, it is a celebratory lauding a hymn, the Carmen Christi, of Christ as God in the flesh. Now I'm going to show that here just a moment with the when he says who who being in the form of god well okay <laughs> pun intended who is that referring to All right. back in verse what is it five i think what is it um uh, let's say who being yeah you? let this mind be in you which was also in christ yeah christ jesus and so the word christ means what 
one who has been anointed Mm -hmm. in any context is what that means. The one who has been anointed um, in the Septuagint everywhere. So then, so Christ Jesus, who, and there's your, I I think that might be Haas. I'd have to look at the Greek text, but regardless, it says who being in the form of God. Okay. Who is this relative clause referring to when it says who? He just defined him as Christ Jesus. If this is the pre-existent world, who anointed the second person? You couldn't anoint the second person. Wouldn't he already kind of be anointed if he was co-equal and co-eternal? And and you couldn't anoint Noah. How could he be anointed? He would inherently already have anointing as God, the son, as they would say. So Mm -hmm. the whole thing is contingent upon the identity, the referential identity in verse, uh, I think it's five, Philippians 2, 5. Um, but then, yeah, you do go on to read who being in the form, the morphe of God. Now, BDAG, you, you can find BDAG and some others lexicons that their commentary says this is the pre-existent. But the, as happens quite often with lexicography, the commentary refutes or rather is militating against the actual definition they just gave. So it's just like Thayer or something else. You have to learn how to distinguish between commentary and grammatical fact. And that takes a lot of maturity in my, in my, in my experience. I'm not sure I'm still there, but the point is it's, it's, it's very important. So who being in the form of God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Trinitarians will use, uh, I think it's Hegesita, did not consider. Uh, when did this considering happen? They will typically ask. The first thing that hits my mind is that if this is the pre existence, then you have separate minds in God all day long, period. There is no other option. I mean, how could God the Son consider something? that God the Father is not, or God Hmm. the Holy Spirit is not. This is separate, and then form also can mean body. Uh, In fact, most of the time, I think, I want to say that this is the only instance where someone could say, this is off the top of my head, okay, but I think that Morphe is like 60 times maybe, or or maybe that's Franeo, let this mind be. I don't remember which one right now off the top of my head. But regardless, it's the only place that it would mean of Morphe, for example, form. It's the only place it would mean nature or characteristic. Uh, every other place it means like a calm, physical, something physical, something that you see. And, and, and so oh. it's the same thing. This is referring to Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, as the Messiah, who has been anointed, and he did not grasp or hold on to his divine prerogatives, which were rightfully his as God in the flesh, but as being our example. And that's the whole point of what Paul's saying. Quit the fighting, quit the bickering. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. Take on a nature of humility, of servitude, etc. That's the whole thing that he's saying. I mean, I think I said this to some others before. How on earth can I, uh, uh, how on earth can I imitate what God did in heaven? I Mm -hmm. can't imitate what God did in heaven, but I can the Messiah, God in the flesh, and that's the whole point. Gotcha. Okay. So are are there others that believe this? Before I forget, yeah, there are. Um, Lutherans believe that that way. I think Doctor recently deceased, late Doctor Robert Raymond. Uh, believed it that way, many, numerous that believe it that way. Yes. And these are Trinitarians. Right. Yeah. There's, there's always, it's interesting. There's always a uh, disparity between even uh, the right. scholars right. who look at yeah. these things. They don't necessarily agree uh, one-to-one. Of course, you don't hear that when you're, when you're watching a debate or you listen to somebody uh, prove a specific point you never hear the fact that well i mean 30 percent of scholars totally disagree yeah, with what i'm right, say right. type of thing um it's always right. that unified like oh this is what everybody thinks 
<laughs> yeah, no, um, and, and to your, quickly to your point about that, yeah, I really was thinking earlier today, I really like the format that this guy is proposing. I mean, I, you know, I get emails of people I don't even know, never heard of, wanting to debate, and I'm just, I mean, I'm just not going to, I don't know, I mean, I've debated them all. Who else is there to debate? I, don't, I mean, uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to keep, you know, going, it's very laborious, it's very time consuming. And yeah. I think that we get further in this kind of a format because there's no gotcha moment. You're not on guard. Right. That's so. what I don't like. I mean, debates are entertaining mm -hmm. um, somewhat. But if you're trying to get to, in my opinion, if you're trying to get to truth, you're trying to discuss something and, OK, let's let's find some of these nuances or let's find mm -hmm. where the differences are. Mm -hmm. It's it's much more amicable to get just just talk about it and you know, be, mm -hmm. have a Berean type spirit and okay, let's go mm -hmm. study it and hear your position. And what are you not saying? What are you saying? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, well, definitely. and and I do want to say though, that we have seen, and I know you're not making this claim, but we've, by the grace of God, we've seen many Trinitarians come to the knowledge of the truth, be baptized in Jesus name, see the Holy spirit because of the debates. So they are, yeah. I have emails all the time to that end, but w so they are, you know, they are beneficial, but yeah. the, the difference is that's the spectator and this is the one doing it. So, <laughs> uh, you know. yeah, no, I, I watched, um, yeah, I've watched lots of debates and there, there definitely are people that change their minds based off debates. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, no doubt about that. Um, and I, I personally, again, I'm, I, they're probably f fun to some extent and they're, um, and they've had their place for sure. But I think, yeah. Again, a long form discussion. A lot of times in a debate, you're very pressed for time. Right. You know, especially when they do the Q and A, it's like if you can get a good gotcha in there, and the guy doesn't have time to really flesh it out or think about it, it's like, oh, he clearly won. Well, it's like, yeah, but he was just better at asking those questions at the right time. <laughs> well, you so, know, in the last year, I I think I did a I did yeah I did a debate online, and they they approached me as they always do. They approached me. And I told them, I said, look, you know, this is just simply the, the rules of polemic discussion, polemic dexterity. If you approach me, I get the last speech because whoever mm. gets the last speech is always usually the one who wins. Well, guess what they did? The Trinitarian got the last speech. Oh, and we had oh, already agreed that we were not going to do that. And I've got the, the, the emails to prove it. So, wow. yeah, so, that, you know, I'm not saying they were dishonest. I'm not charging them with that. I'm just saying that I don't think they really understood the rules of engagement. Ah, yeah. Yeah, definitely possible. So, so I, my question, you mentioned earlier about uh, like uh, James White and, and I've heard him say, you know, if, if people in churches had to take a test, um, most people would, would fail miserably. Um and and yet he's very staunch on on his belief and and you know a lot of times we'll we'll throw out the word heresy and heretic and these kinds of things very quickly. What is your the same thing I asked uh, Sean Finnegan as well? So I'm just trying to be consistent. What what is your take on folks who don't see the the nature of God in the same way? Let's say someone you know, loves God, they're following Christ the best of their ability. Let's just say they believe everything exactly like you, except they're also Trinitarian. Do you think those folks are good to go? They just need to come into some, some more understanding <clears throat> of God, or would you say, nope, that's not, that's a, you're, you're, you're not a brother in Christ, your salvation's at, at risk. How do you view that? <clears throat> okay, so it's two things with that. First, let me give you a direct answer because very often we're, we're you know, people say, oh, they're hedging. They don't want to answer it. I, the, the direct answer is based upon what I see in scripture. No, I don't believe that, that they are saved. But let me mm -hmm. say quickly that that doesn't make me happy. I, I've heard some people before of various movements, including this movement, oneness, that it sounds like they're almost happy that people are going to hell, you know? And, and I'm <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I, I'm sorry. God has no pleasure in, in the death of, of the wicked. I'm not saying they're wicked, but it's a principle. But it, why? Why do I believe that? Because of Mark 12, 
the most important commandment in the Bible is that you believe, and we all believe, that God is hace, masculine, singular, one person. And mm. Trinitarians will say, oh, it doesn't say one person. Listen, hace is used 100 times in the Greek New Testament. Not one time does it mean more than one person. But they're going to try to run to Galatians 3.28. I'm, I'm well prepared for that if they do that. Um, they're going to try to run to stuff like that but it's not going to help them. So, and in every instance, and let me say that doesn't even bring into the fray, the Septuagint. If we bring that in, I mean, it's way more than a hundred. Never does it mean hmm. more than one person. So, so that's why they're, they're living in violation of the most important commandment. When, when you quote Philippians two, or you appeal to, if they want to go to Daniel or wherever they want to go, the, the handful of pluralities that, they think is proven the trinity we have to understand that out of the mouth of jesus himself he said the most important commandment is that god is one and he uses hates um and so everything has to be interpreted under that umbrella it, hmm. it's again the spiral nature of hermeneutics you start out with the big picture and then you come down to the minutia secondly the uh, the other reason why is because of john chapter 8 john 8 24 where, where jesus says if you don't believe that i am you will die in your sins he is not there as we know it's, it's what's called an intransitive verb it doesn't have the a transitive verb would be like god is love love would be the object of the transitive verb god is is it's an intransitive verb so what you have in john 8 24 is jesus says if you do not believe that i am you will die in your sin i mean he explicitly says that it's sin to not believe that i am the one singular yahweh of the old testament and that's exactly why they picked up stones to stone him john 10 30 uh i and my father are one I, I, you know I'm well familiar with the plural <laughs> verb and, and, and that they Trinitarians appeal to. Um, but the reason I'm bringing up John 10 30 here is because relative to Hayes, Dr. A.T. Robertson, um, who's the guy that recently passed away, uh, who, who's an apologist. He had some problems, I think, that come out later. I don't remember his name. He's from India or something. He, uh, all of these people say that if Jesus would have used the masculine singular, uh, even the NET, for example, I'm remembering now the footnotes, uh, that if Jesus would have said, use the masculine singular haste, then we would have oneness. They call it Sabellianism, etc. But we would have oneness if it was haste. <laughs> the gig is up because Jesus did use haste with the, mat with the most important commandment in the entire Bible. So these are quotations from Greek scholars who are saying this, you know. So yeah. that is why, and, and then also the, the plan of salvation. I mean, you know, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother subject. But um, that's really something I'm more personally interested in. I don't know about debates. I mean, I guess if they want to, but I, I think we really need to discuss the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. Because I don't think nobody has a perfect knowledge of, and, and I'm not saying, oh, well, it's okay. You're never going to understand. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying you can't say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You got to be born again first. Hmm. So that so the Go so the I guess through the through the Book of Acts where the where the church is actually in action. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I guess why why would it be? that they don't really focus on God's nature and preaching, hey, it's there's only one God and, you know, Jesus Christ. I mean, most of the time they preach Jesus mm -hmm. and then the response like Acts 2 and those places. I don't, I could be wrong, but I'm not sure of a place where they're really saying, hey, it's, it's important to really focus on understanding the nature of God to be saved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's a very good point that, that, that you're bringing up. Um, yeah, I'm thinking Acts 10, uh, where that Jesus, or excuse me, Peter goes to Cornelius' house and he does exposit the scriptures and he does identify that remission of sins should be in his name. So in a kind of an incidental way, they do. Mm -hmm. But to your point, yeah, they're not really 
I mean, I'll probably think of something afterward, and you will too, but off the top of my head, the only thing I can think is Acts 2 that would be the most definitive where that he unpacks Joel and et cetera, et cetera, to identify who Jesus is. And then from there, they're baptized in Jesus' name. You know the rest of the story. They yeah. see the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, et cetera. So, but yeah, I don't see a didactical breakdown. However, that goes back to the spiral nature of hermeneutics. The Old Testament nature is preparation. Everything's rolling toward the Messiah. The mm -hmm. Gospels is manifestation. That is to say, what was manifest of the preparation of the Old Testament. The book of Acts is then propagation. It's put out. The Gospels being put out. Then you go to the epistles and you have explanation. And then you go to Revelation and you have consummation. It's all wrapped mm -hmm. up. So that, to me, goes to the spiral nature of, of hermeneutics. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So I think you'd be, well, not, not in your understanding of the nature of God, but definitely in the same mindset. I've heard a lot of Trinitarians say that, that if you don't see it that way, yeah, that that's, I mean, that's you're you have a different, I think I heard one guy say one time, like you, you have a different Jesus, you have the wrong Jesus and therefore, you know, you're lost. I, I tend to look at, Again, at places like Acts, 1 Corinthians 15, where he says you're saved by the gospel, and then he gives the gospel. He doesn't mention anywhere about God's nature or you know, those kinds of things. That's where I'm kind of curious. But again, there's there's people on all sides, I think, of that. It's not just oneness or just Trinitarians or just anybody. I think there's a lot of people that um I think he also mentioned that scripture, unless you believe I am he. Yeah, um, they so do. And, and and you know, the funny thing is that, and I promise I'm not trying to be ugly, but the funny thing is, I would say the same thing. I, I mean, you have in Trinitarianism, the, the school Trinitarians at least, you have you have a second divine person that has his own mind, that has, I mean, if they're going to argue for Daniel and Revelation 5, then he has his own body. He, I mean, hmm. how could you not have a, another Jesus with, with all of that going on? Yeah. Um, but I will say this, and maybe some folks won't like it but i hope i'm wrong i mean i hope that i hope that they you know that they are do i believe they are no but i don't shout about that you know yeah, yeah. i'm not glad about it you know i'm gonna need his mercy too on judgment day oh amen to that amen to that well i mean um i think that that's most of the questions i had at least prepared do you have any other things you feel like we didn't get to or, or points that you'd like to wrap up with or anything? <clears throat> Not really, other than to point out that the, you know, the single person pronouns under the Old Testament is very, very important. Isaiah 44, 24, uh, for example, you know, single, it's not just that there's one God. Because mm -hmm. if I had Trinitarian apologists here in this, they would say, well, we believe in one God and all those scriptures prove is that there's one God. But it, what you're not addressing is the single person pronouns used right. in conjunction with masculine singular participles in the Hebrew and Greek. And right. on and on we can go. Now, hmm. they'll usually say, oh, well, that's not even relevant. I've heard them say that. They, In fact, I think James White, I think. Uh, responded that way to me in our debate, if I'm not mistaken. That's not even relevant. Well, then if it's not relevant, then don't use it in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Don't use where Jesus speaks to the Father, he used single person pronoun, and then uh, Father speaks to him. So don't use it in the New Testament if it's not relevant. Problem is, 75% of the Bible is Old Testament written by Hebrew hands, <laughs> right. and even Trinitarians will tell you, the Old Testament does not teach a Trinity, if they're going to be honest um yeah. so i think that that is very very important is to read closely through isaiah for example 40 through 44 um isaiah 9 6 i know what they say about that father of eternity and etc i'm i'm well familiar with their arguments but my point is i think that those things need to really be brought to the forefront along with these what john one philippians two colossians one hebrews one they try to use 
these are five or six <laughs> passages that they try to use and then just completely ignore or explain away and don't do the hard work of exegesis with these other issues. Hmm. I, I just, I just, I think that it really causes, you know, people to look like, like I said earlier, like they're, it, it can look like when you're playing cover up the whole time, but they're not addressing any of the things that we're bringing up other than to some little, Oh, well, that's not even important. Well, <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the, so if you had to choose one or two from the old Testament and one or two from the new Testament, just the strongest support for your position, what would you, do you have any go-tos or is it just too vast? Well, yes. Isaiah 44, 24, of course, there is, there is absolutely no plurality in that whatsoever. Um, it doesn't even exist there. Masculine, singular participles, you have a single person pronoun. There's another scripture in Isaiah 40, 45, or somewhere around there, where it uses a single person pronoun. God says, beside me, he uses a single person pronoun. He says, there is no Elohim. If Trinitarians are going to tell us that Elohim is the Trinity, a plurality, then you have Yahweh saying, there is no plurality beside me. And he uses a single person pronoun. Is he being honest? I mean, was he telling his people for 4,000 years that you have to believe that I am, there is none else, none beside me, single person pronouns. And then in the New Testament, oh, well, you know what? There really was. And, and it's just, I mean, it doesn't exist. The scripture in 1 Samuel, where he says the eternal one, um, again, we have these uh, Hebrew singular, uh, single person pronouns. Eternal one, not eternal three. And they can't say, well, that's referring to the being of God. Because that's what they'll usually say. Well, the single person pronoun of the Old Testament refers to the being of God. But mm. the New Testament, it refers to the person of God. You can't shift and play willy-nilly with the grammar of a single person pronoun like that. Um, so that would be Old Testament. And, um, I mean, there's a lot. New Testament's Mark 12. Uh, Colossians 2, I mean, man, we could just go up. First Timothy 3.16, if you go with the theos, God was manifest in the flesh. Um, First John 5.20, that's another one. Uh, do we know that the Son of God has come to give us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ? This is the true God and eternal life. The syntax in the Greek is, is almost identical to John 17, 3, when the same writer said that you're the only true God. This is coming from Jesus. I mean, it really would make no sense for the second co-equal person in the Godhead to refer to the first one as the only true God. So, you know. Th Which is John, well, that's John 17, 3, right? That this is eternal life. Yeah. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah. And so... That would basically be it. Um, you know, I would just point people to Acts 238 salvation. I, I'm aware of all of the I address that a lot on the blog. Um, you know, the, the assertions about Acts 238. I mean, I mean, there's many others. I mean, Acts 10. I mean, we could just go on and on, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's why I asked I asked the previous in the context of if somebody believes exactly <laughs> like you, except for their understanding of the the nature of God, because there are actually a lot of Trinitarians who baptize in Jesus' name, um, yep. repentance, and even infilling of the Spirit, speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. But their yep. their difference is is they 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 see a Trinitarian mindset. I came across um, for the first time several folks like that, probably six or seven years ago, the the last Reformation movement, and I was shocked. Um, Torben Sonnengard is is kind of over that, and they do a lot of street ministry. Like they'll they'll hit the streets, mm -hmm. pray for people, deliverance, healing, all kinds of you know cool stuff. And um, in their teaching, they do teaching videos too. He's very 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 uh, big on Acts two, repentance, mm -hmm. baptism in water in Jesus name specifically, mm -hmm. and then infilling of the Spirit, evidenced by speaking in tongues. Um, so yeah, a lot, a lot of good stuff, but um, no, I really appreciate 
uh, you know, your time. I know it's, uh, it's been a couple of weeks trying to get together, but this has been highly worth it. This has been an incredible discussion. I really appreciate it. Where can people, um, get a hold of you if they wanted to follow up with questions, or I know you mentioned the apostolic, uh, apologetics, is it.com? Yeah, it's apostolic academics. Academics. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Apostolic academics.com. I haven't, again, I haven't written anything on there for like three or four years. My wife and I have both been having some pretty serious health issues uh, in the last few years. So we've been trying to get over that. But um, there is plenty on there with regard to, I mean, we address the early patristics, Ignatius. That's a whole other subject as well. Trinitarians will appeal to, you know, Tertullian, Theophilus, and et cetera. Uh, try to appeal to Ignatius, but Anyway, I address all of that on on the blog. Um, they can send me a comment on there, or probably the easier way to get me would be just my email. Um, one to God, O N E. And I'm doing this, and I'm thinking, oh my God, you're gonna be, <laughs> you're gonna shoot yourself. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, one God, O N E G O D six seven. One God six seven at Gmail dot com let me just follow it up and conclude by saying you know i get again i get stuff all the time would you be interested in debating this one and that one that i just i mean who else is left I, i've debated them all just about yeah. i just i don't really i mean i guess i would if it, if it was right i mean i don't know i'd have to see but you know that's not really something i'm looking for anymore particularly yeah. with our health problems you know so anyway just wanted to throw that out there i also enjoyed my time uh, with you. You've been nothing but respectful and uh, it's, it's been an honor. Yeah, this has been, this has been fantastic. And I, we maybe we'll follow up. Sean, Sean Finnegan uh, mentioned that it'd be great to have a, a second round of these with uh, the history. You mentioned Ignatius and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the early church fathers as they're referred to. And you know, that 300 year period where they really, worked on some of those creeds and stuff. And he, he said that he thought that would be a really good follow-up. So maybe we'll, we'll try something like that um, in the future. That'd yeah. be really, really cool. <clears throat> we can do that. Just, I would just say that every, I mean, I've got quotation after quotation, after quotation, even recent uh, <laughs> from, from like Daniel Wallace, for example, where he says that clearly Paul did not think in Trinitarian categories and that came later. And what they mean yeah. by later is Chalcedon, Constantinople, etc. Yeah. You know, I will say this: Constantine gets a whole lot of bad press <laughs> for stuff he did not do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say. I mean, the Council of Nicaea, the, the Nicene Creed, is not all that. It's not really all that big a deal. It's it's later. You get to three eighty one. Right. And, That's right. You know, those. It's like whoa. Now it's really started to develop. And and again, that doesn't mean that doesn't mean it's not true. It, yeah, it no, means it means that's where the language was developed. And so you always I think you mentioned the beginning, very beginning, wrap in, bring it full circle. It always has to go to Scripture. Scripture is yeah, where it, it doesn't matter how you formulate a, a view. It doesn't matter if they had to work out some of the language and nuance. It needs to be in Scripture is the main thing. You know, every time I, I hear that, and I'll just say this last little thing here, but every time I hear that, I remember having a discussion with a, a pastor once who had had some, some problems, and he mentioned to me, we were good friends at one point, and he mentioned to me going, you know, going to sit under somebody. I remember suggesting to him, I, I threw a name out there, and he, he responded back, and he said, absolutely not. He said, he, he, said, he teaches against wearing ties and wearing like a tie like around you and I, I said really i said and he said yeah, absolutely not i'm not gonna the difference is that i when i heard that i thought why i mean is there something i'm missing um that's not why i don't have a tie on by the way <laughs> <laughs> i was like wearing it but um i couldn't find one actually but but the uh the, the, i'm not even dealing with the conclusion the point is that he just out of hand rejected it Whereas personally, I wanted to know why. I'll, yeah. I'll listen to anything that anybody yeah. gives up, man. You know, but they better support it with good exegesis. So that's right. it. Amen. Well, thank, thanks again, Roger. This has been a pleasure and an honor. Thank you yeah. so much. We'll put some of your information in the um, 
description for this this video as well and we will uh hopefully stay in touch and maybe do another one yeah. of these. that'd be great yeah we can do it if you could just send me some of the stuff at some point when you get everything wrapped up you know so be good okay man awesome enjoyed it thanks god bless all right god bless bye-bye Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that content from Bread Breakers. If you enjoyed the content, give us that thumbs up. And if you have any suggestions on future content or anything like that, don't forget to leave us a comment in the comment section. Also, subscribe and hit that notification bell. That way, every time we put out something new, a new video, a new interview, whatever it might be, you will be notified. We will throw some additional videos and playlists up here on the screen. And as always, God bless you. We'll catch you on the next video.